Snyder, managing director of Market Gauge, has spent decades examining the intersection of macroeconomics and technical analysis to identify the trades that will provide the biggest returns. As part of our Don't Wait for January series, we sat down with Mish to talk about 2023. Should we be overweight commodities? What's the outlook for precious metals? Is the U.S. dollar bull run over? These are just a few of the questions we tackled as we try to navigate what promises to be a volatile transition. Hi, Mish. I'm so glad we get to catch up and take a look at the new year. Yes, it's such a wonderful time of the year on one level and maybe not so wonderful on other levels, which is exactly, I guess, what we're going to cover today. Exactly. It's to see you. I mean, one thing is sure, people are ready to close the book on 2022, right? But we need to, even though we want to sort of just, just hit pause, we need to kind of be thinking about what we need to prepare for for the new year. And I know you are really always thinking about that because we don't want to suffer unexpected drawdowns and we don't want to have to be sort of digging out of a hole. Um, but there, you know, there seems to be a lot of uncertainty and I think a lot of anxiety about what's ahead in 23. So let's, let's touch on some of the macro themes first and then we'll talk about what that all means. And it seems that the issue of inflation is still really important when you're trying to figure out your sort of thesis and, and make investment decisions. So what are you thinking about in terms of inf the outlook for inflation? Well, I believe that the face of inflation will change, but that it's very much here to stay. And I still think we have a super cycle of commodities headed our way. Obviously, as I always like to put as just sort of a, a, a warning, is whatever you and I talk about or whatever I mention to people, whether it's through writing contribution or in interviews, the ideas are one thing. Obviously, risk management, as we really learned in 2022, is always going to be the most important thing. So when I say that I'm looking for inflation uh, in a very different way than what we've experienced, then I'm obviously going to be looking more at different types of instruments than what really worked in 2021 into 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because you constantly see people talking about recession and it's almost like the word inflation has taken a back burner because this is a market where you're trying to put a square peg into a round hole. So many things have changed. You, you're in this sort of sticky inflation camp. You think there, it may look different, but there, we are in for a period of sort of, you know, sustained higher prices. So what does that mean for interest rates in the Fed in that case? Well, I think that's one of the major reasons why inflation could take a turn much more seriously to the upside, as we'll see evidenced in the dollar and most likely in precious metals. And, and obviously, food prices are still going to be a factor. Energy, maybe not as much a factor. Um, and that's because the Fed have really painted themselves into a corner. I see that they went through a, you know, a rate of change really, really fast in terms of getting us. I think it was, what, six times they raised in 2022. There's another meeting coming out December 14th. Most likely they'll raise again. But now you can see the talking out of both sides of their mouth because mm -hmm. certain things have come to a screeching halt as a result of the interest rates going up. And other things they haven't really been able to control. So they're going to have this big decision. And I'm not necessarily so trusting that they will be able to make, even if there is a right decision, the right decision. Mm -hmm. Because if they continue to raise, it may not necessarily stave off some of the geopolitical risks to inflation, some of the other trends that we're going to talk about to inflation. But yet it will certainly put the brakes more on any, and let's face it, we haven't seen much, economic growth. Yeah, it is. There, it's a tricky situation they're in. And, and then add on to that, those sort of longer term issues of, you know, high levels of debt. I mean, a lot of people are just wondering if they are going to be able to address this. So do you do you think that we are headed for recession? Well, not recession in the classic sense. And this goes very much to the point, which is the definitions of everything have been very fluid. Uh, because you can't necessarily put a label 
on even the labor market. Yes, the labor market is strong, but the housing market is weak, but. And it's going to be the same thing with recession from a technical standpoint. Well, didn't we have an increase in GDP? So it, it, I think that when you're looking at recession the way we've looked at recession, say the last time we had a recession, obviously, which was after 2008, where a lot of people are still making comparables, there's nothing comparable in my mind to 2008 to now really, mm. then recession is not necessarily the word I, that comes to my head. It's stagflation. And I know I've been saying that for a very, very long time. And the actual definition of stagflation includes a weaker labor market. But again, definitions have to be stretched. And so that's where I think we're heading is going to continue to slow. Maybe again, depending on Fed, maybe slow even further, but there will be certain things that will continue in the uptrend. And certainly I think commodities and somewhat of a chaotic situation will be trending at least for the first half of 2023. It's interesting because we've been hearing this, that it's it's hard to gauge what's going to happen, except that there's a feeling that it's going to involve more volatility, more risk. Um, you know, a harder economy to read. So you're going to have to be more agile and, you know, sort of more active as you try to grapple with this. It sounds like that's what you're explaining. Yeah. And you mentioned the word volatility, which is something to also really keep an eye on, because even with the market now, the volatility has been low and there, the ratio between the implied and the realized volatility is out of whack as well. And so that could actually be another interesting opportunity if you're an mm -hmm. investor. And I'm not talking about a long-term investment, but when we're going to talk more about that, and I know, but uh, I'm talking about as a trade, I'm looking at the VIX very carefully here because it does seem to be a disconnect, kind of yeah. like the disconnect you and I talked about at our last interview on the dollar, which mm -hmm. I said had topped, and indeed it went from 14 down to 104. So that's another X factor in all of this for next year. Yeah. One of the things that I love when we talk is that you, you sort of take these macro trends, but also, of course, look at charts, which you've done through your whole career. Um, so you're not just looking at technicals. You're kind of trying to marry them both. So let's start with your, um, before we sort of break down into some of the different class, asset classes you're watching, you, you talk about the modern family as your sort of easy way to understand, you know, what you think is going to happen with these macro forces, inflation and growth. And so what, what what's what's in store for the modern family? How are you thinking about that in terms of what kind of sectors you are looking at as we enter this sort of period that's going to be, you know, bumpy and difficult to to read? And I think probably my biggest lesson, by the way, for 2022, just personally, is I should have paid more attention to the modern family. And when I mean more attention is that they have been telling the story and I think mm. they will continue to tell the story. And had I listened more carefully, probably would have had an easier time at making money. I mean, we ended the year okay. We actually ended basically flat to up, which considering where the market is, I consider a win. Yeah. Uh, obviously the whole idea though is to try to make money. And we have this blended approach that has some sectors that have done very, very well. And we'll, I know we're going to talk again more about investors, so I don't want to digress too much. But let's go back to the modern family, because it's, it's, it is the nucleus of everything that we do. So if we start with the Russell 2000, IWM, well, IWM was the first index to fail at the end of 2021, while SPY continued to rally and didn't peak until the beginning of 2022. And just the same, it fell and really kind of not only led the whole movement down, but when it actually held a key monthly moving average, which I know you and I talked about this 80 month moving average, it was when IWM went down to 162, we were holding our breath for a much bigger crash and lo and behold, buying came in. And so the small cap started to lead the market back up. So it's so amazing, right? Where it is right now, as you and I are talking, it's literally between the 50 week, if we're looking at weekly moving averages, and the 200 week. And it's touching around that 179, 180 level is very, very pivotal for whether or not we're going to get a Santa 
Kloss rally at the end of December, or it's going to be more like 2018, where we had a crash going into the end of December. And so I can't even tell you exactly what I think is going to happen other than the fact that there are certain indicators that are showing more risk on, like junk bonds, but not unbelievable, just bottoming out. So what's going to happen with IWM? If we hold the 180 level, 179, 180 level, we still have to get through that 190 level. And if, if it does, then I would say, okay, time to maybe put some of the cash that people have on uh, really holding to work. If it breaks down under 180, the question is going to be, does that mean we're going back down to the lows? Or does that mean that we're going to actually break those lows and go even lower? And I'm not really sure 100% at this point. If mm -hmm. I had to make a guess, I would think that we have a good chance of breaking those lows because those chart points hold once, but they don't necessarily hold twice or three times. Mm -hmm. So if that happens, so... So, so, okay, so Russell is going to be key. Um, what about the other, what about the other, you know, sectors? Do, 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 is, do we need confirmation from any of the other ones or how are they setting up well, and to I finish think the, the year and bring us into the new year? Right. And Maggie, great question because IWM obviously is grandpa, but grandpa has grandma, right? And grandma is the retail. And again, let's go back to the fact that you cannot put any definition into a box anymore. The consumer, everybody thought the consumer was just going to go away. And so yet you look at XRT, which I really like looking at that particular ETF because it's a nice blend between e-commerce, brick and mortar, consumer staples, some discretionary. And that too is holding above the key 200 week moving average after failing when we had that big down move in September and then the up move in October. And it's holding up actually a little bit better than the uh, manufacturing side, which would be the Russell 2000. So again, it's really going to be what happens to the consumer. At what point does the consumer run out of debt that they can incur? Because we know credit card debt's gone up. Their savings rates have gone down. Uh, you know, are people going to start working more, taking more jobs, saving money? But right now, the consumer is saying that whatever dip we might get from this point is still a viable dip until I think retail breaks down. And once the consumer goes away, then we can really start talking about the impact of this stagflation, recession, or whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. Especially in the U.S. where, you know, consumer spending is anywhere from two thirds, you know, upwards of the economy. It's interesting what you're describing with the modern family seems like this pivot from the goods uh, economy to services, which is what we've seen. We've seen the good side really slowing rapidly, but the service end of the economy seems to be holding up. Yes. And so that's why if you look at some of the other sectors that have done well outside of the modern family, you know, you can see that through some of the industrials. The Dow Jones has done very, very well, you know, the dividend paying ones in terms of the sector uh, part of the economy. If you're looking at healthcare and biotechnology, that's been the leader actually of the modern family to date right now. Biotechnology or IBB, if you want to use that or XBI, but we'll look at IBB has actually cleared the weekly moving averages and looks like it's going through a period of consolidation while that sector waits and sees what's going to happen with the rest of the market. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I would say that that could be something that could continue uh, for 2023 very much, particularly certain areas of the biotechnology and service sector besides basic health care. Um, even research that we've seen, tremendous research in Alzheimer's in particular. I keep reading over yeah. and over and over again of these companies that are really trying to come up with ways to either stop the progress or eliminate Alzheimer's altogether. So we'll see. But yeah, but then if you look at transportation, actually transportation, well, we, we averted a rail strike. Okay, great. Um, but we have seen actually transportation sector not really matching the enthusiasm of the consumer sector. Mm -hmm. And so if that's forecasting anything, it could mean that inflation and supply chain issues are still very much here. Um, and so that's important to watch what that does. And then if we kind of wrap it up with the other two, semiconductors, I think have bounced with the rest of the market and for a minute thought, 
that the TLTs going up and yields going down was going to be great for them. And now I think reality is coming in a little bit there, that, that big tech is not necessarily going to have a good time. Hmm. And then finally, regional banks, which was in this range for months, which really shows the spending, borrowing uh, habits of con re regional consumers, not the big banks, that actually now is hitting down at, again, very major support if that breaks. That would be another indication that. So I, what I love about the, the modern family is that when they're all in sync, that's one thing. But when one takes a very blatant leadership role, whether it's on the bullish or on the bearish side, you have to sit up and take notice because sometimes it just may be early, but it's, but it's usually very, very correct. Yeah. So it makes it makes me a little cautious listening to you because it sounds like a lot of parts of that, uh, a lot of the sectors, a lot of parts of the modern family are, are you know, really kind of under pressure to hold up if they're hitting those support levels. It, it seems like it's all on the consumer shoulder um, right now. And then that raises big questions because that brings us back to the labor market, doesn't it? Because if the labor market goes, presumably that's it for consumers. Well, right. But again, the labor market is, I, I don't remember it ever being this interesting to look at all the elements, right? So first you have job openings over 10 million. Uh, you have about four and a half million people unemployed, which is very strong. Um, and then you have a labor participation, which continues to go down. Um, although not a short-term factor, a factor is low birth rate and aging population. So people are retiring uh, and then living off of retirement money, so not necessarily in the job market. And then you have immigration, which is down at a low, and a lot of the jobs that are available were typically taken by the immigration population. And that's if you're looking at, at some of the, some jobs, if you're looking at other higher level jobs in terms of think tank and brain trust jobs, you know, we're not getting a lot of people from overseas who were the scientists mm -hmm. who helped create a lot of the technology that we've seen over the years in the U.S. So it's hard to say, uh, are the people who are looking for jobs going to be taking up the jobs that are open? Are those, are, is that disparity going to continue? Uh, where the people who are working are can continue to work, the people who haven't worked aren't even going to bother to look, and the jobs available. And then the final piece of that is really the most important, I think, and that's wages. Mm. Because in order for these companies to be able to compete and stay in business, they've had to pay more money to people. Obviously, we can see that's all over the place. So yeah. while you have companies laying off, you have other companies that are raising wages, it is I and, mean, you know, when you see the disparate, like you just pointed out, Maggie, modern family, there's a reason why this has been a really tough year to navigate yeah. because it is, like I said in the very beginning, a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. And what I'm hoping for 2023 is the definitions will become clearer. And at some point, the next trend will become clearer. But right now, when you have a chaotic situation, I'll go back to what I really think is going to be the biggest mover of 2023. And that's gold. Really? So what? So what? Why? Why gold? Well, there's some fundamental underpinnings that are happening now. It's hard to necessarily say if anything that you ever hear from China or Russia is actual fact, but right. there's been talk about changing how oil is is uh, paid for from dollars to yuan to gold. I've even heard. Um, you, you have also a situation where there's been a lot of accumulation of physical gold. So apparently there's a shortage of gold. And the last time you and I talked, we talked about sort of the modern version of Brenton Woods, where the Fed was very much buying dollars and selling gold or central banks. And we've seen that flip now, right, since maybe the apex on the day of our interview was when the dollar started to fall and gold started to rise. And also, probably the most important thing is what is the most natural hard asset that people flock to as some kind of a safety play if they can't sink their teeth into anything trending or they feel the world's on the verge of a war or we get a coup somewhere or food shortages continue or social uprising continues. Whatever it is, chaos is great for gold.
So we, we've said that all along, right? But then there are people who are like, listen, that certainly should have been in play all of 2022, well, over the last two years. And even when all these things are lined up, gold just hasn't delivered. Well, yes and no. Yes, compared to the cost of inflation, and if we just look at the Dow Jones from 1980 versus where the gold was, and the Dow Jones is up 35 times that, and the gold really has just basically doubled, sure, you can make that case. But it actually has outperformed the market this year, where the, the market dropped precipitously. Gold has not necessarily gone anywhere lower than, I think, 1,700 most recently. Maybe at one brief moment, it was down in the mid-1600s in terms of per ounce. So I think relative to the performance of everything else, like so many commodities, it's actually outperformed and it's percolating. So just because something hasn't performed for a long time, to me, just makes it more interesting, not less interesting. Yeah, that, that's true, isn't it? What about, what about other precious metals? Do you feel the same way about silver? Mm -hmm. There is a silver gold ratio. And right now, silver is actually outperforming gold, which I hate to use any classical definitions because as we know, all the def definitions have changed. But typically, when silver outperforms gold, that is inflationary, and that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably our biggest positions at this point would be in the precious metals and might be one of my not only biggest focuses of 2023, but definitely a place where you can actively trade and also build a position if it breaks this chain which is the point of what people are saying. Every time it goes up, it sells off. Every time it goes down, it's a buy. So it's been sort of counterintuitive because if you buy breakouts, you're not doing so great. And if you sell breakdowns, you're not doing so great. But once that changes, and this is what I'm looking for, there's one key giveaway I can say is when gold finally breaks out of these ranges, let's say it goes over 1800 an ounce, or if you're looking at GLD, if it goes over, let's say 170 to 175, and it continues to go, that's the kind of parabolic move that fortunes can be made if you know how to do it. And so if we, if we stick with commodities, does that mean that metals take leadership? What happens to oil and energy? Because that was a bright spot uh, for people who, ha who were long that at when, when everything else was getting killed. But is that over? Have we, you know, or, or is this just a sort of temporary uh, decline because we have seen a lot of downward pressure for crude. Yes, and uh, I'm not surprised. If you look at charts from the 1970s, and um, I probably should have sent one to Real Vision, but I will try to include it in my 2023 report. In 1973, as we know, the oil embargo sent the oil prices skyrocketing, and then we went into a recession. And then even though oil came back a couple of times as we got through the 70s, it didn't necessarily go up along with gold and silver as we got into 1979. It kind of mm. peaked, as mm. had many other commodities as well, because that's when the fundamentals change. So when you have a real physical crisis like an embargo or like a, you know, a pandemic that creates with supply so low, all of a sudden this surging demand when it's over, the fundamentals now are not necessarily going to look like that. This is exactly what my whole thesis is. What's going to change in terms of the fundamentals is the chaotic situation that can continue through sovereigns having to spend money to support their economies, through central banks losing more and more credibility, through BRICS now, which is potentially happening, which not only is a risk to the dollar, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with Saudis and China and Russia. Uh, in terms of how they're dealing with oil, um, the U.S. opening up trade with Venezuela, you know, so supply is is a factor. We, I've heard and I've seen charts that show that there's almost no supply left of oil, mm -hmm. and yet somehow oil is always continues continues to be around. That to me is not going to be my. It was a great year for energy and oil as until the most recent time mm -hmm. for 2022, but to me that theme has changed for 2023. What about food commodities? Because this is something I know that you watch closely um, and, and were spot on when we saw those big moves. What's the outlook for food in 2023? Well, China's another big factor there because remember now, China's been still relatively locked down. 
from COVID. And so you've got two major factors is more of a rising demand in food that could happen, uh, particularly from China. And two is you have the factor of weather and mother nature, and we continue to see dry conditions in Argentina and Brazil, which are big food growing regions. So if you just take a look, it's, it's mixed, right? So if you mm. take a look at the wheat chart, wheat has come crumbling down. Um, and yet at the same time, I just saw a chart today that showed that wheat's production is at 2007 lows. Mm. So I would not discount that as a, a food commodity that could go up. But if you look at a soybean chart, it's consolidating near the highs. When I say highs, not all time highs, but the highs that we've seen throughout 2022, with one more move up, soybeans can go skyrocketing. Mm. And if you look at corn, it's also just been consolidating. So all these food prices have come off, but not in the supermarket, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. not where we need them. <laughs> no, exactly. So, you know, this is, this is like, you know, it's like, it's kind of like if you start to put the chain together with everything we talked about and food, whether it turns out to be a great commodity to buy or the source of more social unrest with shortages and people just being so fed up with mm. the prices they have to pay, that doesn't necessarily mean that the food prices will go up, and we'll talk about sugar in a moment, but it definitely will mean back to what we're saying, which is why I think the precious metals are my number one focus. Right. So it sounds food sounds a little bit mixed. So are you neutral on them? Would you be buying them, but on an individual basis as opposed to, uh, you know, a, a broader ETF? Well, like DBA, which yeah. has been so frustrating. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I'm looking more individually now. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I haven't bought soybeans yet. I mean, one of the other things I discovered because I have a trading service and I've had to trade the ETFs for these commodities. Mm. I'm not a big fan. I, I mm. would I would actually say that if you're going to start trading in some of these commodities, you should probably get yourself an education in futures trading and most platforms can do it. Nothing changes about it other than it's still the same technical analysis, it's still the same risk management. The big difference in commodities trading, of course, is you have the near month and then months go out. And, and yet if you just want to focus on a trend, you can look very much at the at the spot month. Anyway, getting back, so yeah, I'm looking at that. In terms of the overall chaotic situation, I still have my eyes on sugar. Uh, we have. A, I always think of you as sugar. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, it's really funny that I've become sort of the the sugar person, <laughs> but I know real vision audience. In fact, when we went to uh, San Diego with you all in yeah. April, people were coming up to me and going, oh, "I just want you to know." I bought sugar at five cents a pound and it was yeah. one of the best trades. So thank you. So I feel a responsibility to report to on keep it on, to keep on top of sugar. Yeah. For us. So, so what, what is the outlook for sugar? Well, right now, again, it's like everything else is just holding in a holding mm -hmm. pattern. If you think about where it was in 2020 at five, six cents a pound, and now it's trading at more like 19 cents a pound, it's still right. I mean, think yeah. about that. It's still three times more expensive than it was just two years ago. So that's why I don't think inflation has, has peaked. It may have crested, but that's different than peaked. Mm. So when we look at the sugar market, I'm, I'm, I am in sugar. I always have to have some position in sugar. We take, we've taken some profit and we have a good stop now that's a profitable stop. But I'm waiting. Once it starts to go up and I'm looking at the continuous contract back over 20 cents and holds, then everything we just talk about will definitely come to pass. We'll see a second surge in inflation. We'll see gold go crazy. Maybe energy will go up in response to that. Um, the only big difference now is some ag tech things are, have emerged and there's technology that's working on, particularly through AI, on being able to make food development more efficient. That mm -hmm. might be a thing, but I don't necessarily think it's the thing for 2023. It's just a thing to watch as we get through 2023. Yeah, and, and with all of those innovations, and I talk to people a lot about that, and there's some really amazing things going on. Scaling is still an issue, so it's not going to be a near-term resolution to any any supply, uh, you know, concerns that we see. What and what also, are, we're a rich country, but there's a lot of other countries right. that aren't so rich that are, are not going to be able to count on that type of technology to feed them. Yeah.
Yeah. What 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 is your uh, outlook for the dollar? Do you think that it continues to weaken? I mean, it did sort of peak right when we were talking uh, last time and we have seen it come off those highs. Is that is the dollar bull run over? Well, yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can't see bounces. So Mm -hmm. right now, I, I mean, it's actually amazing. If you look at a chart on DXY, it landed right on the 50 week moving average. I mean, it's, it's just incredible to me how sometimes those moving averages work. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the basis of my whole book, Plant Your Money Tree, Guide to Growing Your Wealth, which talks about phases and, and, and these uh, moving averages uh, because they work. So here's what happens. So DXY, right, goes from 114. My feeling that it had peaked wasn't necessarily based on technicals. It was more of my sense of the fact that I could feel and see the flip of the, of the running into the dollar as the market was getting ready to show some signs of a bottom as well. Mm. Uh, and it just seemed unsustainable at this point, too, that the dollar could go up much further in the face of everything that was going on. So right now, at 104 is where the 50-week moving average is. So it got oversold. We had a mean reversion. If you like to look at momentum indicators and Bollinger Bands, we cleared it. Uh, We actually made the new low a couple of days ago and closed above it yesterday, which is kind of somewhat of a clean reversal signal. So now it's going to be how much do we bounce? Not are we back in a bull market. I do not believe that. But how much do we bounce? Can we go to 108? I think that would be a great opportunity if it doesn't go much further to look at the fact that the dollar now can go back down. If we don't get up as far as 108, if we can, we sort of peak out even up here at 105.50, and we can't seem to get much many more legs at this point, then we break 104, and then I think we're going to go down to like 97 to 100 and think about the implications of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we know how much pressure the dollar wrecking ball has been putting on, on so many parts of the global economy. Um, you know, when, when we look at the... U.S. equities. Let's let's turn our attention there for a second, because so many people have that in their portfolio, and I think this is really going to dictate sentiment um, a lot. It it's it sounds like everyone. I mean, you're talking about an economy that's kind of got mixed signals. Your modern family is feels like it's at a kind of tipping point, but it's hard to say which way some of this is going to go. It sounds like there's an awful lot of uncertainty as not only we head into the end of the year, but into the first quarter of next year. How do you, how do you know how to position around that uncertainty? Well, one of the things that we are involved with right now is, uh, you know, we still very much trend following through our quants. And so our alpha rotation got into bonds and has already Mm -hmm. taken a first profit. So I think that you really have to be able to clear your mind of all the noise and just follow things that are trending and think of them more shorter term than long term investments. That's number one. Number two is it's certainly not a bad idea to have a lot of cash stored up right now. And now I guess would be a good time to mention a little bit about investment patterns that have changed. Because right now, we're seeing a lot of fixed income. People are asking me all the time, well, I can get a one to three year CD at 4%. It's guaranteed income. Uh, The stock market is much more speculative. Does that mean that I should be buying CDs? And I say, well, it depends obviously on who you are, what your age is. But you do have to realize that our inflation rate is much higher than 4%. So you're still not even matching the cost of inflation. Dividend buying has been another trend. Obviously, that's one of the reasons why the blue chips have done really well. And defensive stocks have done very, very well. Are there, are there in this sort of changed environment, so the definitions don't hold, uh, there's going to be, it sounds like, chaos and volatility. Um, are, are we going to see, do you expect any changes in, in the behavior of retail investors? I've heard a lot of people saying, oh, you know, retail's held in, but they'll be the last shoe to drop when they bail out. But but I wonder if, you know, it's such a generalization about a whole generation of investors. What do you, is that, is that a factor that we should be looking at, the behavior of retail investors? Well, there's two types of investors that I'm looking at the behavior on. One is more of the wealthier passive investors that have been in the market for years and looked at their portfolios this year and their fund managers and saw that they were down 25, 30, 35 percent. 
um, and now are very much, and I had a conversation with a friend of mine who um, is very tied into the Middle East and deals with a lot of very wealthy investors from the Middle East. And their big question right now, and I'm seeing this even here in the United States as well with some of the wealthier investors, is not so much how do I make money in the market, but how do I have good risk management in the market? Mm -hmm. So they're starting to look at funds that are more diverse and more blended in their approach. Obviously, the 60-40 didn't work out so great this year. So they're not even thinking, I want to make money. They're thinking, I don't want to lose any more money. Where do mm -hmm. I go? So they're looking at track records on basis of that. Also, believe it or not, commodity funds is had a huge boom up 50% in terms of how much money is being allocated into the funds that typically do, do trade commodities. So that's on the bigger, bigger side. We bring it down to the retail side. Clearly, post-pandemic, we saw a huge surge of retail investors. And I don't necessarily agree that they're all going to just go away. Because I think a lot of them, particularly the younger ones, and especially through the channels they have to talk to each other through social media, are more active, mm -hmm. inherently more active. Options trading has become much more attractive than it ever has been, at least that I can see in the most recent years. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to the younger people, they're day trading options. They're in and mm -hmm. out. And they're starting to realize that, but that technical analysis is a thing. They don't necessarily may look at the charts the way I do, but they have other indicators that, that, that retail investors are looking at now. So they just have to get smarter. You know, it's like saying that uh, after we saw the big crash and any of the big crashes that we've had, um, the survivors survive, people get an education, and there are always going to be people that will go, oh, forget it, that's not for me. I thought it was easy money, but it's not. Mm -hmm. But I'd say for the most part, we're going to see just changing habits, and that's why the market could stay volatile and more active just like we've seen, you know, you get a good low in place, buying comes in, everybody buys as soon as it sort of drifts higher or even soars higher, and then you start to see it roll back down, everybody gets out. And I think there are a lot of people who aren't necessarily beating the market, but certainly surviving this market. So interesting. It's just an interesting spin on it because people tend to, dis I think that's a, People tend to dismiss it or think it was all meme stock trading, but you're describing something very different. It's almost almost um, as if the retail crowd is becoming more professional in the way they approach it, which may mean a much shorter time horizon and more volatility. And that is so interesting. Well, it's also a definition of stagflation is that you wind up in trading ranges. If we yeah. go back to that 70s decade, we had a trading range after things fell apart in the Dow. Um, it basically traded within a range for about five years before it actually started to explode again in 1982. Finally took out a thousand in 1982, but it hadn't broken out of that for years. So, you know, if you look at that as a comparable, uh, we could find some kind of a trading range. People who are looking for new lows in a major crash may be disappointed. It may just be we go back down to the lows and we hang out in this range, say between 3,500 and 4,000 in the SPY. That, yeah. That's possible. I, I would not rule that out. Yeah. It would make it very difficult because you have to be in an active mindset. Um, and, and, and a lot of people don't have that kind of time to trade. But then again, there's also a lot of people who aren't working. So, uh, and also even a, a trend towards people who are home with children, they, they trade for a living now. Yeah. So if you're working from home, you can multitask in other ways. And also people, maybe you just have to be more active. I mean, you don't have a choice. You have to find the time to do it. Um, even if you don't think you, you know, were predisposed in that way. You mentioned the VIX before. Um, you, do you, did you say you see opportunity around that if we are in this more volatile period? Yes. Uh, right now, we've been very much, again, in a range, if you look at the VIX, um, basically trading between like 17 and 25. And so if you're a range person, if you like to look at a range with a breakout of a range, in most cases, like we've seen, things break out and then they fail because that's the nature of this type of market that we're seeing in equities. But in terms of the volatility, I would pay more closer attention in that if right now we're back over 20. If we hold over 20, if the market does not go up from here as we get 
any chance of a Santa Claus rally dying on the vine, and it starts to move up over 22, 23, and really over 25, then I think that's telling you that, um, that, that volatility will increase. And, and we would have no problem buying VIX. People say it's a terrible instrument to trade. But again, if you're an active trader, you can catch a really nice move very quickly. Get in, get out. Mm. And one other thing that I want to mention about inflation is that uh, I just read a, a tremendous amount of research on what happens when inflation rates are at 8%. And they say statistically and historically, it doesn't just correct. I mean, this 2% inflation rate that the Fed wants to get back to is, I mean, it's, it's bizarre. It seems completely unattainable and most likely it will change to 3 4%. But six years to 20 years is historically how long it takes for inflation to normalize when it's been as high as we have been. And chart after chart that I look at, and, and trust me, I always want to be proven wrong in mm. a sense because I don't like the idea of what could happen in everything we've talked about. And I can't tell you how many projections I've seen where we've seen the peak in inflation, and by the middle of 2023, they think it's going to be back down to 5%. And then it's going to go back down to 4% and by 2027 be back yeah. down at 3%. And I'm like, uh, maybe, you know, uh, who am I? I'm, I mean, I'm just another person like everybody else making predictions. But I just don't see it at this point, particularly back down to 5% in the middle of 2023. I, that would be a Herculean task. Mm. And even if the Fed totally pivot. Uh, or, or I should say, forget about pivot. We know that will definitely not happen if they pivot. But if they tighten further, if they can get those Fed funds rate, people say top out at about 5%, is that really going to drive inflation down another 3% from here? Yeah. It almost seems like you'd have to have a really severe recession for that to happen. Right. And then the Fed wouldn't have the capacity really to continue to hike into a recession mm -hmm. because you're going to get a, a major revolt on your hands all of a sudden. Yeah. I mean, people will just, you know, I always say, how, how far can we push people paying higher rates, higher inflation, uh, wages not keeping up, uh, you know, even the safety CDs not keeping up with the rate of inflation. Housing prices, yeah, they've come off, but they're still relatively high. It's just normalizing as I see it. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you say, how, at what point do people go, oh, that's it, I've had enough. I, you know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there's certainly that there's certainly that question and issue around the world. I mean, we see the the you know rise of populism and um, anti globalization, and these are all f I think add to the uncertainty that you describe as we try to look out to 2023. Um, Mish, so let's talk about some individual picks because you do okay. have a couple. So yeah. what are you what are you looking at? What well, I, I, I actually added gold and silver and metals. Which right, we know you and like. I added a little bit to the list since I spoke to you this morning um, about what we were going to talk about. But let's talk about a little bit uh, the ones that I gave you, right? So one was One World Spa. I'm sorry, I was looking at the screen there to, okay, uh, yeah. just to see where I was trading right now. So that's OSW. This has been a stock that has intrigued me for a long time now um, because I had done a big research project for the Bogu Forum in China several years ago. And it came up on the screen as I was scanning stocks in, in, in China. And even though it's not necessarily a Chinese company, and even though we've just heard recently that the service industry got a little bit hit in China, duh, well, when people are home locked up, that happens. But that doesn't for mean- For years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for years. <laughs> right. Right. I, you know, so now we're going to get a surge back in the service economy, I believe, in China once things open up. It's not going to stay shut down forever. So besides the consumption issues that we talked about with food and oil, we also have to look at what's really was trending in China, which is the old generation, the silver generation. They have actually become more westernized as they become more middle class. And One World Spa is really, uh, it's a service that deals with travel. Uh, and we know the Chinese are probably dying to get out of the mm. country and travel again. Uh, it deals with uh, some very good self-help type stuff, uh, gym usage and things like that. Technically, it is, it's sitting right underneath 1040, which is a very, very uh, important line in the sand because that's where the 200 week is. And it's neutral. There's no slope on it. It's just flat. 
and it's been trading in between this range. So once it gets through that 1040 level, particularly on a weekly close, we'll buy it. Let's put it that way. Um, and the other one I gave you was floor construction, which was a stock that we did very, very well in last year. Haven't really traded much this year. And then I saw it broke out of a range and now it's been consolidating. Uh, so I haven't done anything yet because obviously if the, if the market doesn't cooperate, everything mm. will go down, or I should say not everything, but something like that will go down. It's tied to infrastructure, which is going to be the big, big question for 2023 is, are we going to get to see more development in this country in terms of build back better? We don't mm. know. We don't know. Uh, you know, we have a house now that's mixed, uh, even though the Senate, I think, stayed blue after the uh, did, runoff. Yeah. In, yeah. Traditionally, infrastructure is something that both parties can get behind because, you know, you get to bring those projects to your state. So I think that despite all the animosity, um, that's typically a bipartisan issue. Typically, yes, but we haven't really seen any movement in infrastructure through mm -hmm. either administrations, Republican or Democrat in quite some time. It's, it's a long time coming. It would be wonderful to see happen. So, um, so, so is that, that stock more of a second half 23 when you see whether we can get through, you know, how the U.S. broader U.S. equity market holds up and whether we get any movement on infrastructure? What would be the catalyst for you to buy that? Well, one would be technical. If it continues to hold up in these levels that it just broke out of, which is really basically over, well, let's call it 30 to give it some wiggle room, and it consolidates and we get into 2023, and it looks like you know people are rolling up their sleeves to try to get things done and move things along mm. in the government, infrastructure will be way top of the list, obviously. Then I think it would be not only from a technical standpoint, you'd have a good risk, but most likely from a fundamental standpoint, it would be a good thing as well. So, um, so that's why that's made the list. I also, believe it or not, you know, I've been reading a lot about EV batteries and uh, lithium. And um, the company, again, I'm going to look at my notes so I don't say it wrong, Tetra Tech came to my attention today. Uh, and I'm sure, Maggie, you talked to so many people who are you know, so much more involved with these companies and these fundamentals. I kind of search and find, and then whatever resonates is kind of what makes, sticks into my brain. And this was one that did, because they're, they're looking at making batteries without lithium through zinc bromide. Mm. And that would be huge, obviously, because the reserves of lithium, like copper, are really, really low. And so T-Tech is another one that I've been sort of looking at uh, right here. But again, it's broken out. It's actually in a much better phase than a lot of the other equities I've looked at. It would be something to keep an eye on. I don't know if I necessarily want to run in right now in December when people are starting to scale back and getting ready to take their breaks. Like you said, fed up, just tired, close the books. Let's see what happens. We've got to get ready. we got to get ready for January, though. That's why we have to have, we have, to have at least a shopping list. Ready exactly. To so I would put that on the shopping list. And then, you know, some of the other ones that I'm looking at for a shopping list is, you know, besides what we were talking about in biotech, I like Teva, uh, it, which is an Israeli pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. Hasn't done much yet, but again, it's been consolidating. What I really want to find is companies that can fit the narrative of everything we talked about. Either they're going to be pricing uh, proof in that they can withstand any kind of major chaotic or they benefit from something major, majorly chaotic. And it's not necessarily commodities based, but more in terms of the needs of what people have to have mm -hmm. than biotech in itself. If we just look at IBB, we talked about that 130, 135 consolidation. Tiva would be one. Uh, there's a couple of other companies out there. Obviously, if you look at some of the uh, classic ones like Biogen and Vertex, they've done very, very well. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Alzheimer's research is something that really interests me. So if you wrap it up, it sounds like this is an environment that's going to be, it's going to be difficult sledding. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of the sort of old benchmarks, definitions, and rules 
are morphing and changing. It sounds like, you know, certainly what worked before, and we've heard this, what worked before isn't necessarily going to work, but it lends itself to your style, doesn't it? Because you have a trader mentality and you kind of overlay macro with technical analysis. So it sounds like you're planning on being pretty nimble in Q1. Is that right? Definitely starting out that way. Um, we'll want to see what happens if and when dust settles then I have no problem becoming more invested. Mm -hmm. But like I said, right now, the little voice in my head that I hear over and over keeps telling me gold, gold, gold. <laughs> so um, that's, I don't think you have to have 25 positions to prove that you're a great investor or trader. Don't forget, I grew up in a situation in commodities where most of the guys like Paul Tudor Jones, for example, made their fortunes in the super cycle of commodities, trading just a few commodities. Mm -hmm. They didn't also, I mean, they developed portfolios as we got into the 80s and 90s, but they made their fortune during that period of time just trading very few instruments, the commodities that were hot and running from one pit to another. So if gold was starting to go up in volume and activity, everybody would run to the gold market and buy gold. And then if the oil market started, you know, and it was constantly that rotation. And that's how I've been trained, is I'm looking for the rotation. If something dies, I'm gone. Go and yeah. find the next thing. And if commodities are going to be hot, great. And if it turns out that any of these other things we've talked about turn out to be hot, great. Like I said in the very beginning, risk management is everything. Mish, it is always fantastic to catch up with you. Thank you so much. Maggie, thank you so much. It's been such a joyous year, mainly because you're in it in my life <laughs> and in and our lives in Real Vision. So thank you all very, very much. Oh, that's great. And Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. New Year to you. Happy New Year. My key takeaway from this conversation is courtesy of Led Zeppelin 1971. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold. Gold is one of Mish's top picks as we head into 2023. In fact, it's one of the few things she feels outright conviction on. Mish expects the start of this near new year to be chaotic and volatile. Much like Diego Perea, she believes inflation will stay elevated and volatility will be a constant theme. She feels that should benefit gold and other precious metals. Big picture, she still thinks commodities are in a super cycle, but energy will no longer provide leadership, at least not in the way it has. In fact, she cautions against broad baskets of commodities and thinks this is the time to educate yourself and trade in individual commodity names. Patience and risk management will be key, but for those who can navigate the rocky start, 2023 will provide opportunity. Mish is looking at some individual names in the EV battery space, wellness and leisure in China, engineering and construction, and biotech. In the short term, however, Mish advises less is better. Pick a handful of trades you feel really confident about and ride them up. That will put you in the best position to take advantage of opportunity in the back half of the year.